Hi everyone, and welcome to worship. My name is Craig Jamie, the pastor of St. Stephen's United Church of Christ in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Thank you for joining us online. Today is the second Sunday of Eastertide, and I will be preaching from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, entitled, Doubts Are Faith. Let's prepare our hearts for worship with a word of prayer. God of resurrection surprises, open our hearts this day to the presence of Jesus Christ. Erase our excuses for unbelief and exchange them for a bold witness to the power of your mercy, peace, and love. Give us courage and challenge us to walk the path of discipleship, knowing that Jesus goes before us. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. If you have your Bible with you, please turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. We will read verses 19 through 31. Hear these words from John 20, 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and my hand in his side I will not believe. A week later his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. May God add a blessing to the reading and the hearing, but most importantly to the doing of God's written words. All right, I'd like to invite the children to come forward for a children's time. Good morning, boys and girls. I trust you're doing well. Have you ever wondered what Jesus' body looked like after he was resurrected? Before we answer that question, it's important for us to remember that the Bible is not a science textbook. And even if the Bible was a science textbook, which it's not, but if it was... The field of science has changed a lot in your lifetime, so it would have changed tremendously in almost 2,000 years. Okay, back to the question. What did Jesus' body look like after he was raised from the dead? According to the Bible, Jesus was recognizable, so his body did not really change that much in appearance. In his resurrected form, Jesus can talk. Do you remember the phrase he said three times in today's passage? What was Jesus' go-to greeting? Peace be with you. Today we say, peace, as a farewell goodbye. Peace, I'm out. Jesus, however, said peace as a greeting. That's different. All right, uh, we, what else do we know about Jesus' body? Well, twice in the passage there is an emphasis on the doors where the disciples stayed being locked. Both times Jesus came and stood among them and offered peace be with you as a greeting. Obviously, Jesus' body was different, but he was alive and breathing. It appears he could walk through locked doors, which is pretty cool. Jesus' body still carried the wounds of his crucifixion. Remember, Jesus told Thomas to see and touch his hands where he was nailed to the cross. He also told Thomas to reach out his hand and put it in his side where he was speared while on the cross. That means Jesus' body was a body that could be touched and seen. He could talk, he could stand and walk. That's interesting, isn't it? Do you know what else I like about this post-resurrection story? 
I like that Jesus understood that his disciples needed to see in order to believe. Jesus mentioned to us while he spoke to Thomas, he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Jesus knew it would be harder for us to believe than it was for the disciples who got to see him. Jesus' response to those who believe without seeing him was to bless them, to bless us. Among the gifts of Easter are Christ's peace, the Holy Spirit, and happiness. The word blessed in the New Testament means happy. Jesus gave his disciples the gift of the Holy Spirit in verse 22. In addition to the gifts of Easter, Jesus gave the disciples, and by extension us, a task or a mission in verse 23. Do you remember the task Jesus gave his disciples? Let me read the verse which will help you answer the question. If you forgive any sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Well, what is our Easter task as given by Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit? Forgiveness. That's right. We've learned about Jesus' resurrected body. We've learned about the gifts of Easter, which are peace, the Holy Spirit, and happiness. And we've learned that forgiveness is one of the tasks of the church. Now you know why we have a prayer of confession and an assurance of pardon or forgiveness every Sunday. It's what we do as followers of Jesus, the resurrected Christ. Well, let's pray together by repeating our prayer out loud. Our God, we thank you for the peace of Christ, the promise of the Holy Spirit, the happiness of believing, and the task of forgiving. Take care of me, my family, my friends, and my church. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, children. I'm going to speak with the adults now. And you're also welcome to listen. And as always, if you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask because we learn by asking questions. You got it. In my estimation, there are at least 13 sermons waiting to be preached from today's focus reading, which is good because John 20, 19 through 31, appears as the gospel text for the second Sunday of Easter in all three years of the lectionary cycle. Now, according to the liturgical calendar, today is my first anniversary with St. Stephen's, although I started my ministry with you all on April 13th. Last year, on the second Sunday of Easter, I preached from this very same text. But don't worry, though, it's the same text, but a different sermon. And no, I'm not going to preach all 13 sermons in one message today. <laughs> no matter how many times we visit a biblical text, we almost always see something new. That's true today, and that's the beauty of Scripture, and that's a gift from God. What if I told you doubts are faith? Is there one person listening today who has never, ever questioned the core of the Christian faith? I doubt it. See what I did there? <laughs> we have a consistent practice of reciting the Apostles' Creed or the UCC Statement of Faith each Sunday. I suspect we don't have much trouble believing in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, or in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, or that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried, on most days, believing in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic or Universal Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting is no problem. But if you think long and hard about conception by the Holy Spirit, being born of the Virgin Mary, at some point you might conclude that Jesus was Italian because only an Italian mother could think her son was God, and only an Italian son could think his mother was a virgin. <laughs> I read that in an email forward decades ago, I believe. The confession that Jesus Christ descended into hell is grounded in two New Testament texts, 1 Peter 4, 6 and Ephesians 4, 8 through 9. What's interesting about this part of the Apostles' Creed is that in all the other parts of the Creed, the biblical grounding is the Gospels and Acts, which is the second volume in the Gospel of Luke. You might wonder why it's included at all, but you'll remember that Peter and Paul were apostles, and thus the Apostles' Creed. Today we're looking at what happened on the evening of the third day when Jesus rose again from the dead, long before he ascended to heaven and was seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from where he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
According to John's Gospel, this is the fourth and fifth resurrection report. The first report of the resurrection came from Mary Magdalene, who ran and went to Simon Peter and the disciple whom Jesus loved. The second report of the resurrection came after the disciple whom Jesus loved bests Simon Peter in a foot race to the empty tomb, sees it empty, and believes without seeing the body and without knowing the Old Testament scriptures and without the testimony of anyone other than Mary. Now, lest we be impressed by the boys, John 20, 10 reads, Then the disciples returned to their homes. <laughs> I mean, Mary gave her testimony and the disciples? Nothing. This is perhaps why some scholars believe Jesus may have been a woman. <laughs> because he kept trying to get a message across to a bunch of men who weren't listening or just didn't get it. Okay, that's a joke too from that same email. Oh, there are no scholars, by the way, who think Jesus is a woman. Now, the third resurrection report appears to be a flashback of Mary weeping outside the tomb, mistaking Jesus as the gardener until he calls her by name, revealing his identity. Yet, despite Mary's good news that Jesus is alive, the disciples remain unchanged. They're afraid. They have locked all the doors. They are huddled and hiding. And then Jesus appears to the disciples in the fourth resurrection report, bringing peace, breathing the Holy Spirit, and sending them on a mission to forgive the sins that Jesus' death took away. A week later, the disciples haven't started on their mission yet. I mean, you'd think Jesus had asked them to take out the garbage. The fifth resurrection report occurs. This time, the disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. The doors were shut. Jesus stood among them again, saying, Peace be with you again. This time, Jesus came specifically for Thomas. He must have noticed the twin was missing the first time. No problem. After showing Thomas his glorified body, his nail-pierced hands, his spear-torn side, Jesus tells him, do not be unbelieving, but believing. In the Gospel of John, the word believe is never a noun. Believe is always a verb. Believe is an action. Believing in Jesus is less about a certain, certain doctrines as a confession of faith. Believing in Jesus is more a confession of an abiding relationship. As Dr. Caroline Lewis writes, quote, Believing in Jesus is not about believing in someone else's experience of Jesus, but having your own encounter with the Word made flesh, close quote. Following this encounter, Thomas answers Jesus with the, my favorite statement of faith ever written, My Lord and my God. Thomas didn't say, My Lord God. No, Thomas said, My Lord and my God. Thomas uses the my pronoun to show his ownership in believing the resurrection. Doubts are faith. Unbelieving is still believing. The very act of doubting what you believe is an act of humility and humanity. If you've never doubted, you have not allowed for the possibility of something else to be true. If you've never doubted your faith, it's probably not your faith. Unbelieving is learning. Unbelieving is discipleship. Unbelieving allows you to experience and interpret your life in the light and love of God. I would argue that having doubts is the exercise and evolution of faith, or as 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. Taking tests help us learn and grow. Exams are not just benchmarks of learning, but they can be springboards for learning. The same is true of entertaining our unbelieving. Each time we examine our faith or scour the scriptures and search for meaning or reflect deeply on theology that doesn't make sense to us yet or deconstruct beliefs that we've outgrown, those doubts are not to be condemned. They ought to be raised and examined and questioned and engaged carefully. Years ago, I bought a beautiful blue button-down Oxford shirt on eBay. When it arrived, I opened the package immediately and put it on. Right away, I realized something wasn't right. But I buttoned it up, stood in front of the mirror. It was the perfect color that made my blue eyes shine. The shirt fit perfectly across my chest and was long enough to wear chinos tucked in or shorts untucked. The only problem was that the sleeves were about two inches too short. I couldn't return it because it would cost almost as much to ship back as I had paid for it. So I decided to keep it and wear it as a rolled up shirt. I giggled every time I put that shirt on. 
because it didn't fit, but I was still rocking it, making it look good. I probably wore the shirt a few years before I decided that a man about my size with Tyrannosaurus Rex arms would enjoy it, so I donated it to the local Salvation Army in exchange for a sermon illustration. There are beliefs we hold on to because they've served us so far so good. Some of what we say we believe is secondhand. This preacher said that, that preacher said this, my mama told me, my daddy believed, but you're not so sure, so you don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. And like that too short secondhand shirt, it never fit 100%. Unlike the shirt that someone with shorter arms is enjoying now, maybe we don't just grow out of our beliefs. Maybe we also grow into believing as we have our own encounters with the resurrected Christ who comes to us and reveals himself to us. There is a thread in the discography of singer-songwriter Nicole Nordman. God doesn't change, but we do. And as we change, our believing changes to fit the seasons and situations of our lives. One of my favorite songs in this thread by Nicole Nordman is entitled, I Am. The song is set against a quiet violin and calm piano chords. Beginning with her childhood, each new verse traces her understanding of God, what she calls God, a short prayer, and God's answer to her, which is the title of the song, I Am. In her understanding, God is content with being elbow healer and superhero to a child learning reality. God listens carefully as heartache healer and secret keeper to a teenager who is loved and lost. God offers a steady hand as shepherd, savior, and pasture maker to a young family finding their footing. And finally, to a weak and ailing adult braced for heaven, God is creator, maker, life sustainer, comforter, healer, my redeemer, Lord and king, beginning and end, and I am. It's okay to have a healthy skepticism about matters of faith. Empirical evidence about faith is collected through what we observe, measure, document, and experience. How we interpret that evidence allows us to build our faith and to test the integrity of our beliefs. We need not replace Holy Scripture with a holy spreadsheet, memorizing formulas to supersede the mysteries of God. What we can do is look around, ask pertinent questions, join interesting conversations, appreciate differing viewpoints, spend your life in service of others, and forgive as Christ forgave you. You will be amazed to see the resurrection all around you. While you may not put your fingers in the hands of Jesus or hold, you may hold the hands of someone with deep wounds and offer them forgiveness. Now, you might not put your hand into Jesus' side, but you might get the opportunity to put your arm around their back and walk beside them through some rough terrain as they grapple with forgiving. If the secret sauce of humor is sorrow, then the secret source of believing is, you guessed it, doubt. Doubt serves an important role in developing our faith. The resistance or even rebellion of faith builds strength and stamina to one's spirit, much like lifting weights builds muscles. The longer we live, the more we learn. The more we learn, the more we realize how little we know. Since we can't know everything, some things we'll just have to trust to faith and poetry. Our creeping doubts are faith looking for plausibility because, frankly, certainty is overrated. Our God, amid the worries and doubts of the disciples, in the middle of their fear and behind locked doors, your son Jesus stood among them to offer peace. Our Lord and our God said to Thomas, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Give us a blessed courage this Easter tide to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, to acknowledge that doubts are normal and useful, and to use our moments of doubt to reinforce an abiding relationship with you. We pray for those with whom we are in relationships. Some struggle and suffer with mental, emotional, and physical pain. We pray for their healing. Others fight to manage their addictions. We pray for their strength and recovery. And thank you for every miraculous moment of sobriety and time spent well with family and friends. We all need the constant love and support of our families, friends, caregivers, allies, champions, and church. We thank you for your permanent presence among us. Draw near to us as we draw near to you. Help us to receive your many gifts with gratitude and faithful stewardship. Help us to work hard for a more peaceful, fair, and equitable world for everyone. And hear us now as we offer our deepest needs, our pressing burdens, and our hopes and fears to you in silent prayer.
We have spoken the names of people and places that need healing, comfort, and care. Admittedly, we all need each other's prayers and consolations. O Lord, attend to these prayers according to your will, letting all creation see the glory revealed in your Son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I hope you have a good rest of your weekend and a great start to your week. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday, and in the meantime, please know of my daily prayers for you. As we close our time together, receive this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.